Hey guys, welcome back! Let's continue to dive into my favorite DOS games year by year. And this is getting tougher and tougher to choose and decide. So, are you ready to discover my 10 most played DOS games from 1991 that indeed grabbed my attention? Let's take a look! Bear in mind that for this one I had to leave out of the top 10 games like Gods, Leisure Suit Larry 5, Space Quest 4, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe, the very first Duke Nukem, The Blues Brothers, Superplex, Megalomania and Prehistoric. All these were that close to be promoted to this year's top 10, so consider them as honorable mentions. I've played most of them on my Amiga 500 and not on PC back in the day, so that's the main reason for them not being featured in the top 10. So with that said, let's dig in! Join Mac, Mac Caveman Ninja. Ninja. If you usually watch my content, you know that I'm a huge fan of arcade gaming. I spent countless hours hanging around at the many arcades I had in my area back in the day, so I was always looking forward to grab the many conversions of my favorite arcade games over to the ZX Spectrum, Amiga, Mega Drive and PC. Joe and Mac was one of those examples that I loved so much and spent tons of coins at one of those local arcades and that I simply had to have the PC port made by Elite Systems. It features the characters Joe and Mac as caveman ninjas in a multi-level platform area where we have to jump and club incoming enemies. We can also throw at them from distance using such weapons as boomerangs, bones, fire, flints, electricity and stone wheels. The objective of the game is to rescue a group of voluptuous cave girls who were kidnapped by a rival tribe. To do that, we have to fight our way through these prehistoric places packed with dinosaurs, carnivorous plants and those annoying rival cavemen. Our journey is filled with comical situations making this title so entertaining and highly addictive, in such a pleasing and amazing setting, packed with some of the most gorgeous graphics that I saw until then. Speedball 2 Rural Deluxe I didn't place gods in this top 10, but Speedball 2 had to be here! A masterpiece by the Bitmap Brothers that I already brought to the channel within the complete history of the bitmaps that I invite you all to check out. The link will be in the description below and on the top right of the screen. Speedball 2 Brutal Deluxe offers a violent futuristic gameplay that is also fast and frantic, with heavy tackling encouraged to retrieve the ball, but you already knew that if you've played the previous one. There are 5 game modes, Knockout, Cup, League, Practice and Multiplayer. Each game lasts for 180 seconds divided into 2 halves. Power-ups and tokens appear on the pitch, including ones to make our players extra tough or freeze the opponents. Speedball 2 makes several changes over the original Speedball. Each team has 9 players on court rather than 5 and targets on the floor and walls can be hit for bonus points. The number of points that a team receives for scoring a goal is normally 10 that can be increased to 15 or 20 via the use of score multipliers located on the walls of the pitch, but the opposition can sometimes immediately grab the ball and nullify this. The same number of points for scoring a goal is given for injuring a player from the opposing team. When a player is injured, is replaced by one of three substitutes. If all three substitutes are injured, the injured player will be forced to return to the game and play on in spite of his injuries. There are also 5 stars which are worth 2 points each if we hit them, more if we have the multiplier activated, but this can also be cancelled out by the opposition hitting the same star. Next to the stars there are portals, which throw the ball out to the opposite side of the pitch in the direction it was going. Speedball 2 was first released for the Atari ST and the Amiga a year prior and was a huge hit on both systems, but this PC port was even considered by PC Gamer Magazine, the 24th best computer game of all time, claiming that you just can't beat this game for pure action. Police, Police Quest, Quest 3, 3 The Kindred. Kindred. 
The Kindred is the third installment of the Police Quest series and its events take place after those described in Police Quest 2 The Vengeance. The game brings back some of the elements of the first game, such as a modified version of driving sequences and police procedures unrelated to the main plot. Computer work is particularly emphasized, requiring the player to perform tasks such as using facial composite software or figuring out murder patterns by studying a map. Like other Sierra adventures of the time, the game uses an icon-based interface for interaction with the environment. Sony Bonds, the sergeant of Lighton Police Department, thought he could finally enjoy a peaceful life with his wife Marie after the drug lord Jesse Baines has been put away for good. However, a series of gruesome murders perpetrated by a sinister cult known as the Kindred shocks the city. Marie becomes a victim of their attack and falls into a coma. It becomes Sony's very personal mission to track down the attackers and make them pay for their crimes. This third title in the series is still very enjoyable and probably the best within this, let's say, style of crime-solving, brain-melting, puzzle-matching, CSI impersonation of a game. If you watch my documentary on Sierra Online, Jim Walls was convinced by Ken Williams to come aboard and write intriguing plots for the Police Quest series. Sadly, during the late development stages of this third installment, Jim ended up leaving Sierra due to, and I quote, circumstances. Sierra employee Jane Jensen finalized the writing for the still unfinished Police Quest 3 and former LAPD chief Daryl Gates was named to take over the Police Quest series. Jim Walls, along with several former Sierra employees, would go on to design Blue Force. Meanwhile, check my documentary on Sierra online if you missed it. Link above and in the description below. The Simpsons, the Simpsons arcade, arcade game. game. And here comes another of my all-time favorite beat-em-up games to play at the arcades. The Simpsons, the arcade game. It was developed and published by Konami and was the first video game based on the Simpsons franchise. Three more would come soon after and in that same year. It was another one of those incredible arcade cabinets that would allow up to four players simultaneously controlling the members of the Simpsons family as they fight various enemies to rescue the kidnapped Maggie. Homer punches and kicks, Marge swings her vacuum cleaner, Bart wields his skateboard and Lisa uses a jump rope as a whip, but other weapons such as hammers and bowling balls are also available to use. The game's levels are Downtown Springfield, Krusty Land, Springfield Discount Cemetery, Moe's Tavern, Springfield Gorge, Dreamland, the Channel 6 Studio and the Power Plant. Each level ends with a boss whose speed and strength will increase after taking a certain amount of damage. End level bosses are the wrestler Professor Werner Von Braun, a hot hair balloon shaped like Krusty the Clown, a pair of bouncers, a drunk at Moe's Tavern, a henchman in a bear suit, an imaginary gigantic bowling ball and a martial arts sensei dressed like a kabuki actor. There's also the showdown finale against Smithers and Mr. Burns in a robotic outfit. It was a commercial success and one of the top three best-selling arcade video game machines of 1991. It even features the television show's voice actors reprising their respective roles as the Simpsons family. So this is nothing more than a Simpsons interactive episode. Isn't this awesome? I absolutely love it, because I'm a huge fan of the animated series and as said, of arcade beat'em up games. Feel free to check my top 16 favorites. Link in the usual places. Curiously, it was only ported to the Commodore 64 and MS DOS soon after its launch in the arcades. Wing Commander 2 Vengeance of the Kilrathi. The basic gameplay of Wing Commander 2 is very similar to its older brother that I brought in the previous episode. However, there are all new ships for both the Kilrathi and the Confederation. Only the Rapier returns from the previous game in an upgraded version. 
The Wing Commander series trademark cinematic storytelling is greatly expanded in this second entry in the series, with many animated cutscenes continuing the story between missions. Our carrier, the Tiger's Claw, is destroyed by Kilrathi stealth fighters and we are blamed for the loss of the ship. After being demoted, we are transferred to a space station far off the front lines, where we are supposed to spend the rest of our career. What a sad ending for such a good fighter pilot, right? But 10 years later, we're able to save the Confederation flagship, the Concordia, from a Kilrathi attack. On the ship we meet many old friends, so back in the cockpit it's up to us to stop the Kilrathi and prove our innocence in the destruction of the Tiger's Claw. But that's not as easy as it sounds. Since capital ships now employ phase shielding, making them immune to normal weapons fire, only special torpedoes can damage them. Only heavy fighters and bombers are able to make torpedo runs. Before a torpedo can be fired, the shields of the target must be analyzed to find a way to get through, which results in a long locking phase during which the bomber must not move. The bombers are equipped with one or more gun turrets to protect them from enemy fighters during the lock-on. Another new technology are chaff pots, which can be deployed to lure enemy missiles off the target. Such an amazing game with a highly engaging and addictive plot that has the power to draw us in and immerse ourselves for hours in a row. We've destroyed a capital ship! Oh no! Oh no. More lemmings. lemmings! The original Lemmings is simply my favorite game on the Commodore Amiga. Again, check my history video on it to know everything and more. Link is, well, you know what it is. So when another Lemmings game was announced, I simply had to play it. And to exhaustion. It was released in both the standalone and the add-on version and features 100 new levels and all new graphics and music. Later a Windows 95 version of this game was released in, well, 1995 that included practically all of the levels from Lemmings and oh no more Lemmings. As you can witness, the gameplay is identical to the original Lemmings. However, while the first few levels for the fun rating in the original game are tutorial-like, the tame levels in this one are just simple levels without hints on how to complete them. All following levels are way more difficult than those from the original game and become tougher at a much greater pace. Even so, these new levels are way more entertaining as they present a much greater challenge than those from the first game in the series. And if you bought the German magazine CD player back in the day, the full version of the game was given away for free by mistake in their February issue of 1994. The editorial team received two unlabeled discs from Psygnosis, one with the full version and another one with the demo version for the cover mount CD. And they mixed them up. Yeah. Heart of China Heart of China is an adventure game with a romantic theme somewhat reminiscent of films such as Raiders of the Lost Ark and being a huge fan of Indiana Jones, I simply had to play it. The game is set during the 1930s China as well as a few other locations. It uses a simple point-and-click system for interaction and object manipulation and is very similar visually and gameplay-wise to Rise of the Dragon released a year prior. Some of the tasks in the game have multiple solutions, allowing us to pursue different methods and choose different responses in branching dialogues. However, some choices may lead to the death of the main protagonist or bring the investigation to a dead end. There are also a few arcade sequences which can be skipped if we fail to complete them after several tries. The game utilizes digitized photos of live actors superimposed on beautiful hand-painted graphics. Curiously, a 16-color EGA version was also produced but rarely distributed, probably because it wouldn't shine through with all the magic and beauty of those hand-painted graphics. As for its plot, we simply have to rescue Kate, the daughter of a wealthy businessman named Lomax. She was abducted by a Chinese warlord named Li Deng near Chengdu, where she was volunteering as a nurse. 
Lomax recruits a former World War I fighter pilot Jake Lucky Masters, that's us, for a dangerous mission. Travel to Hong Kong, locate a mysterious ninja and find a way to infiltrate Li Deng's fortress and rescue Kate. <laughs> as simple as that. Heart of China was truly ahead of its time in some respects, like for instance, it assembled a cast of nearly 100 actors. Now, that's truly impressive for a video game released back in 1991. Sid Meier Civilization Sid Meier continues to bring amazing experiences to gamers and his latest achievement was with Civilization. It has the widest scope of any strategy game of its time. We are a leader of a nation. We begin in a stone age and our eventual goal is to become the dominant civilization in the world, either by wiping out everybody else or being the first to get a spaceship to Alpha Centauri. As the nation's leader, we have many responsibilities, like building cities and then micromanage them, constructing various buildings. Most people in our cities will be working on the neighboring lands to get food, cause without it, our community won't survive or even grow. Some will work on production, to build military units and buildings, and trading, which can be exchanged for money, science or luxuries that make people happy. We decide how much trade we want to invest into each of these areas and we have to make sure that our people are in a good mood. If they get too unhappy, the city will collapse into disorder and won't produce anything until we fix the situation. We can even build wonders of the world such as the pyramids or the Hoover Dam. Each wonder is a unique thing and only one of each can exist in the world. They give us a lot of benefits if we complete them, but they take a long time to build and many of them will eventually stop doing its thing. There are obviously other nations in the world, but also the threatening barbarians, so we'll have to invest into the military to protect our people and attack the enemy. Peace treaties can be signed with other nations and even exchange scientific knowledge with them, but eventually we'll probably have to fight. We control each of our military units on the world map, attacking the opponent's units and cities. And I could be here all day talking about civilization, it's such a huge game, so it's better for me to go on to the next one. Huh, I almost forgot, due to a bug in the game, the pacifist leader Mahatma Gandhi could become extremely aggressive and make heavy use of nuclear weapons. <laughs> yeah, never saw that happening, but this fact remains as an urban legend in gaming. Another world. I believe that Eric Chahi learned something with Jordan Mechner and his Prince of Persia game. When Eric needed a model for the rotoscoping sequences, he got his brother to run around in the back garden of their house. <laughs> Yeah, Another World was a true technical achievement back in the day. It was the first to have cinematic cutscenes seen in many games since. Even Fumito Ueda from Eco fame claimed that Another World was an influence to him and to that iconic game. All graphics are filled vector images, something that was used before to save disk space with early adventure games like King's Quest, but never before in an action game. Also, all music and sound effects are mixed in real time to provide multi-channel music and sound on modest sound hardware, even on a 286. The Amiga and Atari ST versions came out first and many players complained that Another World was too easy. So Eric asked Daniel Moraes to include in this PC version two extra levels and slightly increase the difficulty in some other parts of the game. Oh yeah! And you're probably asking, who the hell is Daniel Moraes? Daniel Moraes was the guy that ported Another World to DOS and was later one of the lead designers of Eric's Heart of Darkness. A young physics professor named Lester conducts a particle experiment. Suddenly something goes wrong, lightning strikes and in a moment Lester finds himself in a strange alien world. Now he must fight for his life, first with his bare hands, then with a gun he finds. But what gives him courage is that he is not alone. 
one of the aliens who also escapes from the prison, helps him on his dangerous quest. Friendship can overcome all obstacles. Another world combines shooting, platforming and puzzle solving elements. The game is divided into stages. Some of them are straightforward and can only be accessed one time, while others are connected to each other, creating a larger environment. Exploration and problem solving are emphasized and many levels include challenges not seen in the previous ones. Tasks may involve environmental puzzles, timed sequences, precise jumping and combat. Out of this world was its North American title, simply to avoid confusion with the popular but unrelated TV series Another World, airing since 1964 on that country, and Flashback is often regarded as its sequel. The true sequel came in 1992, Heart of the Alien, exclusively for the Sega CD. As for Flashback, designed by Eric's colleague Paul Cousset, it simply drank inspiration from another world, just like Eco, Silent Hill and even Metal Gear Solid. Monkey Island 2 – Lechuk's Revenge This was inevitable. Monkey Island 2 had to be in first. After the huge success of the first one that came a year prior, Luchuk's Revenge arrived and simply blew everyone away. I even have a freaking poster on my wall. I tried to play it on my Amiga 500, but the dreadful disc swapping routine was truly annoying. The game was even known among the Amiga community as the disc juggling simulator, <laughs> cause it came with 11 diskettes that had to be swapped around whilst playing the game. Insult sword fighting was truly missed in this one, but even so, it's one of the best selling adventure games of all time. It uses the same command based scum interface and branching dialogue system that were used in its predecessor. The game features hand painted graphics and was the first to utilize LucasArts iMuse system, which synchronizes music with visual action on the screen by providing smooth transition between themes. The events of the game take place on a new set of islands, and uncommonly for adventure games, Luchuk's Revenge features two difficulty levels. The easier one is dubbed Monkey Island 2 Lite. It bypasses or simplifies some of the harder puzzles and was destined to magazine reviewers as stated in the back of the box. Guybrush Tripwood, the mighty pirate who can hold his breath for 10 minutes, could have lived quietly and happily with his sweetheart Elaine, the governor of Malie Island. But the restless pirate spirit won't let Guybrush in peace. Things didn't go very well with Elaine, and Guybrush embarks on a new adventure, searching for the legendary treasure of Big Whoop. However, the evil ghost pirate Lechuk hasn't left the stage yet. His minions are trying to bring him back from the dead one more time. That's the premise of the game, and if you haven't played it until today, please do it! Just don't suspend Guybrush above a certain pool of acid for a certain number of minutes. He will be lowered into it and die, despite what everyone says about LucasArts adventure games. So guys, here you have it, the 10 games released back in 1991 that I spent the most time with. Tell me down in the comments section below if you've played any of them and feel free to share your personal favorites from that particular year. I would love to know cause I'm sure that I'll discover a ton more by reading your feedback. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed this episode, you know the drill. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers!